In today's episode of All Is Not Lost, I had the pleasure of interviewing Thomas Patrick Gormley, also known as the Archangel of the Paranormal. I met Tom last month at the Strange Escapes event we both attended in New Hampshire, and right away after chatting with him for a while and hearing his stories and experiences and varied background with the paranormal, I knew he would be a wonderful guest to have on the show. So stick around and enjoy the interview with Thomas Patrick Gormley. Spirit, does it stay? Does it go? The fact is, spirit does survive death. Our loved ones are all around us. Love survives. Spirit survives. All is not lost. Welcome to the All Is Not Lost podcast. Here's your host, psychic and evidential medium, Rianne Maldonado. Okay, so I'm super happy to see you again. I'm so <laughs> glad that you agreed to be on my show. Um, how have you been? I have been good. I've been very busy, as you might yeah? see if you click onto the uh, social medias. But uh, after uh, I met you in New Hampshire, in the White Mountains of our spooky hotel and our spooky weekend, uh, had uh, some emergency uh, calls, uh, setting up some other investigations that should be good things for my partner and I. Awesome. That's that's super good. Have you done any yet or just set them up? Well, the emergency one, we had uh, gotten a call from uh, a, a client. Um, I guess her boy um, has been getting scratched by something unforeseen. They've been hearing a lot of um, pounding noises and uh, some poltergeist activity with cabinets opening and all that. And they called us in desperation because the clergy actually refused to go out and help them. So we were like, oh, we seem to be the last ditch effort. So <laughs> we've gone out, we interviewed them just to make sure. Uh, the great thing about that, I think that makes my partner and I a little different is she is an actual psychotherapist. So she uh, works with people with um, PTSD, just trauma and things like that. And then with my psych background, uh, working in the prison systems and uh, psychiatric institutions. So we always like to interview everybody just to make sure everybody is on the way, on the, the right wave, as you know. And uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, go ahead. I was just say, I remember we talked a lot about that in New Hampshire because mm -hmm. That's one of my biggest concerns and some of the interviews I've gone on where people, and again, I said this to you in person, I'm not a doctor, but it's pretty obvious sometimes when people need mental help, not help from a medium or a paranormal investigator. Um, I joked, but I'm not being mean I, when I said, you know, I met a woman who thought she had Satan locked in her bathroom. <laughs> um I'm sorry, I cannot help you with that. So I do think it's super valuable that you and your partner have these additional skills to bring with you to the paranormal investigating um, and rule out when it could be something else, you know, health related. So that's awesome. You guys have that. Yeah, exactly. That's always something that we do different. We're, we're not like all the other investigators out there. So we're a little different. We approach things differently. Especially, we always want to interview everybody first, get a history of what's going on in the home, and then from there determine if we need to do um, an investigation. So initially, when we met them, she had uh, put holy water on her son and in his room, and it quieted down. And uh, during the interview, she told us that. I says, well, I'm not going to do an investigation right now, but I... Uh, called a friend of mine who's a demonologist and he says, well, give it about three days. And I agreed with him. I says, yeah, it's probably going to take about three days. Three days later, sure enough, she called back, said whatever, oh. everything was happening again. So we went and did a full investigation. Uh, come to find out, we got just a very little history. We couldn't find much. The house is from 1965 um, and the family lived in it for quite a while. They had four kids. Uh, the The Father and the mother had uh, passed away over in, uh, you know, mid to about 2012, 2014 in their 90s. So they had oh. lived there for quite a long time. But what happened was, is we, uh, my partner being a psychic also was picking up on a lot of stuff. So was I. 
I have some empath abilities and we're just picking up on a lot of things and we have the equipment out to verify. Uh, that's what we usually use our equipment for to verify how we're feeling. So just to make sure what we're feeling is, Hey, that potentially could be something. So after getting some uh, psychic reading that she got, she actually saw the gentleman appeared in front of her uh, psychically. And she says that's happened, happened to her in about 20 years. And I think he was desperate to get his message out. And that's why he was scratching the boy because the boy come to find out we think he has psychic abilities and he hasn't developed them yet. And he doesn't know how to deal with it right now. So we kind of helped him with that uh, just to take back who he is. And uh, from there, we found out that the gentleman was kind of sorry for how he was in life, um, that he was a violent alcoholic. Um, and how we found that out is on an SLS camera. If anybody out there knows how it works, the little green stick figures, it kept pointing down. So we we're like, why does this thing keep pointing down? And we're in the uh, the boy's room and he has one of those trash cans and on it was a sticker. It said liquid death. So we come, oh. it was like a sign that, hey, you know, I did a lot of alcohol and all that. So we just had the clues, put them all together. And from another psychic reach out, my partner had picked up that he wanted us to go to his wife's grave and put daisies on it. So we're going to be oh. doing that very soon. But yesterday, last night, after the investigation was a, like a week ago, but last night we did the home cleansing. So one of the other things that we do that a lot of people don't do is we do it four different ways all at the same time. So we do a Christian blessing. We do a shaman blessing because she's my partner is a trained shaman. And uh, we do a pagan and uh, we do the Tibetan healing bowl. So we do all four at the same time oh, wow. just to be thorough. And, you know, salt along the entrance ways and all that. So we go all out and I usually record during the whole time on my recording device just to make sure that, you know, we're picking up anything. And I have a device going with, you know, just to see if I could pick up any um, EMF also. And when we were down in the basement, we were trying to bless it and I was still getting some hits. So we had to do it a few times down in the basement. So I was a little concerned about down there. But after doing it a second time, I wasn't picking up any more hits on the EMF. So it made us comfortable to leave for the night and uh, just see how it happens. We haven't heard anything uh, since last night. Usually she'll text us. So from there, we're just going to find out exactly where we know the cemetery that uh, she's buried in. We just don't have a time that we're going to go out and where she actually is. And then we're going to get the daisies on there just because we promised uh, the spirit on the other side that we would help them out. So. That's really sweet. And I don't know why all of a sudden, as you were saying that I was getting really emotional, like I wanted to cry. Um, but that's a really nice gesture that you guys are doing that. And I think things like that are why, well, why I enjoyed talking to you in New Hampshire and why we were at the kind of function that we were at, because it's a lot of like-minded people who treat spirits with respect mm -hmm. and go in looking for the story. Why are they here? They're not just here to be mean and attack you. <laughs> um, there's a reason for it. So I, I really like that. That's, that's a great story. I would love to um, know when you guys go do that. And I'm sure you're going to take pictures and document, right? Yeah, we, we have some stuff, but a lot of the footage, I'm saying people's names, and we're a different kind of group. Uh, we have to try and keep a lot of things private. Uh, we don't mm. want people figuring out where the house is, just no. kind of the names that we're saying, because the names of the people that live there were pretty unique, and it makes it kind of easy to figure out uh, if you do some research on it. So we usually try and keep everything private, just for our clients. Um, That's important. I, yeah. My partner and I, we do a lot of the, the private stuff. A lot of people don't want to do the private stuff because you're dealing with the living and the dead all at the same time. Sometimes the living is a lot harder than the dead, <laughs> so, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say more than sometimes the living is yeah. more challenging than the yeah. dead. They're but I want to take... Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, I'm ahead. just saying they're, sometimes they're convinced that their home is haunted and you go through the whole thing and you're like not getting anything and you have to tell them and they're convinced and they get mad at you. So you wonder, hopefully you don't get some kind of weird review. of. <laughs> I know. So, yeah. I think we did talk about that in New Hampshire also mm -hmm. that, you know, sometimes people are convinced and this becomes their identity. They identify with, Oh, I live in this situation. I have this happening. It's causing that. 
And if you don't find anything to validate that for them, uh, it's awkward and they don't like it. Um, so yeah, that, that is a big challenge. Um, I wanted to just take a minute and tell the listeners who I'm talking to. So I am talking to my new friend, Thomas Patrick Gormley, who is known as the Archangel of the Paranormal, correct? Yes. Yes. Which is such a fun name. And okay. So I don't know if I told you when I met you, I hate social media. Like I am the worst and I don't know how I'm ever going to grow my business because I hate social media, but I did a tiny bit of sleuthing on you. And I was so surprised to see you are a singer and a musician. I saw you playing guitar and singing and I was like, wow, this whole other side I didn't know. Not that I know you well, because we did just meet last month, but that's super awesome. Do you do anything else with that? Well, back before my children were born, uh, I was a demo singer doing country music and all that. And I've, I've done my own, my own albums. I've tried out for shows. I made it pretty far on uh, Nashville Star. I almost made it on the show the first season. Uh, so wow. as I get older, my voice gets a little crazier, but, uh, you know, my younger days, it was good. I almost made a living out of it. We used to go to karaoke contests and just to make extra money because we just didn't have anything. And so we, we scraped and did things like that to try to make some extra money back in the day. And uh, I still do it just during COVID. Um, my roommates from college, we went to a Bruins game and, uh, that was the last game before they shut everything down from COVID and on the drive up. We were talking about, geez, we haven't heard you sing in a while like we used to in college. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we'll get together and, you know, we have a little camp bar go, we'll play some songs and all that. I says, I haven't done it in a while. But then COVID hit. So I felt, well, I want to keep my friends entertained. So I went on Facebook and just started playing a song a day. So while I was in quarantine and just to entertain them. And then everybody started watching. All of a sudden, T-shirts are being made. And so it was it was quite a time. So sometimes I repost some of those songs that I remember and enjoy and enjoyed and just want to pass them back on there for everybody. But I've, I've been doing it for a long time. I think paranormal music I've been doing for so long. And I think the music for me, when I write a song is almost paranormal. I always wonder, okay, what spirit is giving me the words to, to say? So it's all intertwined. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Spiritual inspiration. Oh my God. Thinking about, giving and thinking outside of yourself during COVID to help people get through their day or have a better experience and to stay connected. What a beautiful thing. That was really, really a cool thing to do, to share mm -hmm. your gift with other people, to uplift them. And um, that's, that's beautiful. So I was excited to see that because I love music. Mm -hmm. Music is um like I could not imagine the world without music. And I've talked about my love of music in another episode. And, you know, I have a lot of kids and in the car, it's really loud. And the way I kind of tame the wild beasts is I just play music and really loud until everybody kind of just has to get in sync. Yeah. Um, so I also think music does play a part with our paranormal stuff because before I'm going to go to a reading, like if I'm on my way to a group reading, I will play music to try to, you know, lift my soul, lift my spirit, get up in the, in the realm of spirit. Uh, and it's definitely a bridge to the other side for sure. So that, that's super cool. Wait, what a way to combine them both. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I want to know so much. Um, <laughs> I want to know, <laughs> this is my problem. I like to front load all my questions. I mean, <laughs> and then be like, okay, now talk. So I want to know how you came up with Archangel of the Paranormal and why, how long you've been doing this work, what it brings to your life. Um, you know, just, just give me, give me everything paranormal and Tom put together. Okay. <laughs> That's a, it is a loaded question. I so know. I know. <laughs> I, I always like to tell people that. I've been doing this long since uh, dirt was clean. So that's one of my favorite <laughs> right. funny things to say. But I've been at this, um, don't want to date myself, but you know, I, I've been at this for over 30 years. Um, I got my start at a young age. I was in high school and I was just, you know, one of those kids that I felt I was different. Uh, didn't know why, but I tried to blend in and uh, tried to fake everybody out and uh, 
just, you know, the emotional highs and lows and not knowing why I felt way I did. Uh, I met Lorraine and Ed Warren, um, I think my junior year of high school. So, and wow. Lorraine recognized it right away. And uh, she helped me a lot with that. And, uh, you know, fast forward with that over the years, I was in and out of the paranormal, just, uh, you know, things going on in life, life just happened. Uh, then when my mom passed away in 2012, I got really back into it, starting to investigate again and just help people out. I just felt moved to do that. Just what my mom went through in life and, and also it was just important. And especially seeing with COVID, I made it even more important because it seems like in the paranormal world, when big things like that happen, a lot of people die, people are looking for answers. And I just want to make sure that people get the right answers and not the wrong stuff that I sometimes see on social media or some of these shows. And I just want to make sure that people are there to help and do it the right way to help them. And I, I think that's important. So whether it be the spirit needs to be healed or the people need to be healed. Yeah, I I like that. Um, when you say you were different as a child, we might have talked about that in person, too, because I've, I've always felt like the weirdo on the outside looking mm -hmm. in through the bubble. Um, so when you were younger, did you have any um, paranormal experiences that helped get you on this path that shaped you anything spooky where you lived or, you know, anything like that? Or was it just always a, a different feeling inside of you? I've never experienced anything, I think, legitimately paranormal. Uh, there used to be an old Victorian house in our town uh, that all the kids used to go and say, oh, it's spooky. You know, and we think we'd see something, but I think it's just the hysteria of all of us being together. So I never really knew for sure. Didn't even realize that was my first paranormal investigation back in my, uh, you know, <laughs> middle school, Yeah, you know, doing that for the first time. And just a lot, I think a lot of things led to it. I think my background, um, my first job out of college, I worked on an ambulance. So I got to see people going from alive uh, to not with this world anymore, right in front of my eyes and just seeing that transition, getting experience with that. And just working as a uh, confinement officer at a psychiatric prison and dealing with the, the crisis management of that with people like that. Some, some of them are pretty manipulative. And uh, sometimes you deal with spirits that are manipulative like that, too, and you have to be able to deal with that. And again, like I said, my partner being a psychotherapist and just putting that all together with our many, many years of experience, because she got her start with the Warrens also. Uh, mm. and We just came together just recently. This is only our second investigation together, and both of them have been pretty nuts. <laughs> wow. It's good that you have someone that you mesh with to work with, for sure, that thinks like-minded and has similar skills as you. Um, your job at the prison sounds terrifying to me, <laughs> and I, I'm worried I would be easily manipulated so I could never do a job like that. I'm too like, oh, that's such a sad story, when really they're <laughs> just pulling my leg. <laughs> oh, gosh. You got to have so, that, you got to have that decipher between one or the other. And I, I think it, it's very good to have that skill, especially uh, dealing with, you know, the paranormal, or, like I said, dealing with people to make sure they're not manipulating you just to have you there just to get attention or anything like that, or really serious things going on. You know, we don't charge when we go out. Uh, so it's important that we make sure we go out at something you know, real to help people and all that. So we're putting our time in out of our hearts because we want to help people. We want to explain the paranormal the right way and just have it go in the right direction. Sure. And you don't want to waste the, and I use the term waste, but you don't want to waste that on somebody who is seeking help for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. you, you know, and just going to be taking your time away from a client that could actually really benefit from your skills. Um, how do you, how do you, in your community, get the word out that you offer this service? I do a lot with social media. A lot of it's word of mouth. Um, we do have, you know, clients that speak up for us and say they, it's the, hey, I know somebody that could do this. Let me tell you, I'll go give them a call or anything like that. That's how it used to be. The social media is a lot helpful. Um, I use it for the purpose just to to educate. Uh, sometimes some funny stuff, educate you know, music, all those types of things, just to 
to get out there and see what I do. And I do a lot of my friends from high school never knew that I did this. I think I kept it quiet. Mm -hmm. I think back then everybody would think you're wacko, but I think it's Mm -hmm. more acceptable now, just like a lot of things out there are more acceptable now than they were, uh, you know, back in the, the eighties and all that. So. That's a very good point. That's Mm -hmm. a very good point. Um, well, you know, I remember we were sitting down by the fireplace, the four of us, and you totally helped me see a situation I had been through, through completely different eyes, like completely. And so in one of my previous episodes, I talk about how I kind of found out that I had mediumship abilities other than Rianne's just a weirdo, right? And it was through that terribly haunted house I lived in in Spokane, Washington. And so all along, I had thought that the man that had committed the murder and then uh, committed suicide in the house was just this evil, awful man. And he was making our lives miserable, you know? But then when I was telling you um, that, I had received a message that night that I needed to go talk to the principal at the school and the principal was able to kind of give me a different perspective that, that this man who committed these awful crimes and was driving us freaking nuts in our house, um, had actually been very normal and then just snapped one day. Um, and how that had brought me just a little bit of comfort. Well, you blew my mind when you said to me, what, okay, do you remember exactly what you were telling me? Because I'd rather it come from you. Well, I think from what you told me was all along that property um, could have had something dark there. And the gentleman was influenced by it. And that's why he got to the point that he did. From what you told me, you were having issues uh, just getting along with your, your husband at the time. And Kids, you, husband, exactly. money, how everything. So you were being influenced, maybe not by the gentleman that was there, but by the thing that was there that made him uh, get to that point. And I think with your husband going out to California when he did, you avoided anything worse. And that's why I asked him, when you left and you were in California, <laughs> how did you feel about your wife? And he said, I felt better about her. And you didn't know that at the time, but it just proves that the house was influencing how you guys reacted to each other. And and I've got goosebumps again, you talking about it because, you know, I, there's so much we could unpack with that. Like, um, okay. So had my husband not gotten the job in California and stayed, would it have escalated to the point where he would have done something or I would have done something so irreparable like the man before us? That's terrifying to think of, but then also you could bring in. So was it divinely guided that he got this job in California with someone protecting us so that he would leave so that it wouldn't get to that point? You know, there's a lot to go with that, but that's the stuff that is so fascinating to talk about, even if it's scary, because, whoa, none of us know what mm-hmm. what's happening or how or why. And we could talk all day about it, but your perspective really, really opened my mind to that situation. And it's always nice to learn new perspectives from people. So, yeah, I think a lot of it, um, I'm the firm believer in it being in the paranormal for a long time. I do not believe in coincidences. You need to Mm -hmm. keep your mind open when they happen. It is a message in how you interpret that is how you go forward. Maybe we were so ass deep in the situation that (laughs) we, well, I know we were, we were so deep in, there would be no interpreting just, it was a shit show. Everything was bad. So I don't even think we, the people living in the house could have ever stepped back enough to even look at this rationally, we had to move. And I told you prior to this, I didn't even believe in mediumship. I didn't believe in haunted houses. I didn't believe in any of this stuff. I was like, oh, that's nice. That's a good story. Yeah, maybe there's something to it. But now, totally different perspective. Totally different. So I just want to say thank you because that that not only taught me a lesson on how to look at things differently, but it also helped me kind of make sense of our own situation that we were in. So it's always important. And when you go through that proverbial crap show there, and (laughs) I always hope for people that 
they take the time to realize that there's people like myself out there that could put that all together. Like I helped you, but even though it was after mm-hmm. the fact, but when you're knee deep helped. in it, yeah, when you're knee deep in it, that's when I want people to reach out. Um, and just so once it's explained and it makes sense, people relax a little bit more and they're not as living in fear. I think fear is what really juices things up uh, with the paranormal. Oh. And I was fearful every minute of every day Mm -hmm. once I found out. And unfortunately, I didn't know about people like you back then. I (laughs) didn't know. And like your, um, like your client, you were just talking about my son was going to a Catholic high school. And so I even reached out to try to have a priest come. Now I'm not Catholic. I don't know anything about it, but I, you know, seen in TV priests come and help with bad ghosts. You know, that's all I knew. (laughs) They would not come. They refused to come. And I didn't learn until a couple of years later or six months later that the priests in the town were very familiar with the situation, already knew about my house, already knew about everything, and they just did not want to come. So I felt helpless. I didn't know that there were people like you or like me now out there to help. That's why it's important that, you know, like I said, I get out there on social media and there's people that I know that don't believe in this and all that, but they know when something doesn't make sense, even though they don't believe in it, they're going to call somebody that they know believes in it to help them. So a lot of people, it's always been said before, nobody believes in ghosts, but everybody's afraid of them. It was said by Ed Warren and it's so true So for certain situations, but once you get in this field and you learn every day because it's paranormal. If it ever makes sense, it's not paranormal anymore. It just becomes normal. So, and that's what we're trying to do. So people understand, but we'll never know what's going on on the other side until our time comes. But until then, you know, we have to keep at it, keep learning. I think in the paranormal right now, our understanding is like doctors years and years ago where they thought bloodletting would cure everything. I think there's so much we need to learn we laugh about it now, but I think the same thing with the paranormal. There's stuff that we did years ago that we're like, eh, that didn't work. So we just have to keep trying to figure out what's going on. So the more experience you get, the better. But I always tell you, people that are new to it, I learn something from them also. So it doesn't matter. You know, you're never 100% right. You're never 100% wrong when it comes to the paranormal. You just have to keep going forward what works for you and the people that you're trying to help. I just, on that same note, I just did an interview this weekend uh, and she was saying the same thing. Nobody's experts. And if somebody claims to be an expert in this field, go the other direction because we're (laughs) all learning and we all need to admit that we don't have all the answers. Um, I was recently at an event where there were three air quotes here, um, experts doing some stuff that was just crazy crazy town. But anyway, I, I like the idea of we're always learning, we're always evolving. And our mission should be to continue to learn for ourselves and other people, because we shouldn't be calling ourselves experts at this point. Um, okay. So another question I have for you is with all of your investigating, I think we might've touched on this, or maybe even John Tenney talked about this with us too. And I know this is how I feel. And by the way, on a side note, I think my brain has the hugest crush on John Tenney now. (laughs) That was the first time I ever heard him talk. And like, I cannot stop thinking about everything he said. But anyway, back to what I was going to ask you. So John mentioned that the best paranormal investigative equipment is your body. And I, as a medium, feel the same way. I use my mediumship and my psychic abilities to get the main picture. Then I use equipment, like you mentioned earlier, to corroborate, to validate. Um, But if you were going to talk about your favorite piece of equipment, which I think I know from New Hampshire, but I don't know, uh, your favorite piece of equipment, if you could only have one, I want you to talk about that. If I could only have one, of course, (laughs) I, I... I, I don't know. I just love the SLS camera. It's just, to I me, it. it blows my mind. Anytime something comes up on it and I ask it questions and it does what I ask it to, it, it's mind blowing. It's like, you know, psychic so meaning you, you could see the spirit. Sometimes people see ghosts and sometimes this helps. Yeah. And I could see something that potentially could be there. 
you know, is it is it real or not? But when something reacts to me, you know, and sometimes some of the stuff I, I know is just an artifact, but that's why I always want to try and get a back and forth. If it's residual, it's hard to prove that it's actually something. But when, you know, you, you got a back and forth going on, it gets pretty crazy. Like I said, the other night we had it pointing at the um, the can to indicate that it had a liquid type of death. And I was like, geez, this guy's an alcoholic. You know, that's kind of the clues that you lead to. Like I said, there's no such, you know, thing as a coincidence. So yeah. no. and that camera helps to validate, you know, and help us put together the clues to go forward and help people and help families and the other side and the living and the dead. I knew you were going to say SLS, <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted to just hear it from you and make sure that I wasn't just guessing from our experiences. Um, now, when you mention a back and forth with the spirit on the SLS for our listeners, we call that an intelligent response. So exactly. Yeah. So when Tom is telling us about an SLS, it's a camera that, um, and you could probably describe it better than I can, but it basically can see spirit in a stick figure form. And if you have an intelligent spirit and you ask them, can you wave your right hand for me? And they do it. Well, you can draw from that, that you are actually having a conversation with somebody on the other side, um, versus residual. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what the SLS SLS is and residual and intelligent? Sure. Um, the SLS camera was invented a little while ago and it was invented by accident. Uh, there's an Xbox 360, which put out little lasers to pick up your body movement and all that. So you could play video games. Well, a lot of people were playing as a player one and all of a sudden player two popped up and there's like, there's no <laughs> player two here. So a lot of people in our industry considered, well, hey, we could turn this into some kind of paranormal device if it's picking up spirit energy. So let's see, let's turn it into some kind of device, which we did. And then on it with the software, you would just point it out. It could see in the dark. So it, if it picks up energy, it'll, you know, transform into what looks like a stick figure. And from there, you know, you could interact. And hopefully with that, like you said, you could have, you know, residual or intelligent, like intelligent, I asked it to raise its arm um, and it raises its arm. And probably a residual one, which was very odd that we caught on the SLS camera, was a previous investigation that we had where the house we went to, the history behind it, was back in the uh, 1920s. A husband and wife lived there with their six children, and he found out she was cheating on him and bludgeoned her to death in front of his mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. So we were investigating the home, and on the SLS camera, we had gotten footage that looked like one stick figure was trying to bludgeon the other stick figure. Like wow. it was repeating what happened back then. And that was the energy we were feeling. I had goosebumps like you couldn't believe. Mm. And I talked to it to find out what was going on. But that residual effect, but then it was also intelligent almost at the same time because it showed me something that happened in the past, like a movie. But then when I interacted with it, we started getting loud bangs on the wall that I was angry that I was trying to tell it to stop that, you know, there's no longer violence now that happened in the past. We need you to move on, whatever we could do to get it to stop. And then from there, it, the, the knocking went on and one that looked like it was hitting the other one kind of went away. I still hear the knocking and then finally the knocking stopped and the other one looked like it was sitting there, like it was injured. And I said to it, I reached my hand out. I said, if you want to move on, I'm going to reach out my hand and you just touch it. And the stick figure reached out, touched it and disappeared. Oh my God. So it was amazing. I'm covered so. in goosebumps now. Wow. I get wow. emotional like John does when he talks about the floorboard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, it was a, one of probably one of the a most amazing experiences I've had in over 30 years that potentially something could have moved on. Cause I know you can't make things move on. It's, they got to do it on their own. And I, I just felt, you know, the energy of it and all that, that I felt like that would no longer occur anymore in that home. That's beautiful. Wow. I, I don't even know really, but uh, don't even know what to say. Like, <laughs> yeah. What a mixture of intelligent and residual. Definitely. 
And I, like you, don't believe that we have the power to send someone to the other side. I think that's between them and God. But Mm -hmm. whatever you did, whatever was holding that injured spirit back, um, it maybe you, you know, gave her permission to move on. Maybe she didn't know she could. I don't know. We'll never know. But whatever happened there sounds absolutely beautiful. And what a great service to provide to people for sure. Oh my God. Okay. (laughs) So you, I've seen on your social media and you've mentioned this before, and I think you have a little picture of it. Talk to me about the rabbit hole. (laughs) It's it, the rabbit hole is just a it's just a term that we've used for years. It's just I've had a crazy, crazy, crazy has telling you these stories, a crazy life with the paranormal. It, it's not just investigating. It's just a lot of weird coincidences that I have in my life, uh, whether, you know, meeting people like John Tenney and us just sitting drinking by the fire and seeing who could out weird each other. But it's always fun. But uh, I, I tell you, it's just. Anything I do is I shake my head about the paranormal sometimes and how crazy it is. And I just feel like this down the rabbit hole again. That's exactly how I look at it. It's just one of those. Yeah, I can't explain it. So just the crazy thing down the rabbit hole. And it, and, and the funny thing is, is, you know, I'm, I, I like to drink bourbon. That's one of my, one of my things. So I'm not crazy with it. I'm not, you know, but I, I just love bourbon and there's a rabbit hole bourbon in Kentucky. And I've been trying, uh, some friends have been trying to get a hold of them to try and sponsor my content. So I've been trying. So maybe this podcast, they'll hear it and now maybe we'll get another way of getting to them and all that. But I think it would be great. Uh, you know, spirits and spirits, you know, so (laughs) totally what it is. (laughs) Yes. Well, and you know, my, when I've said, you know, Oh my God, here we go down the rabbit hole. Um, (laughs) when, in whatever area of life, it's just like, it could take a billion turns. You know, you could keep talking about this and then you talk about that. And, and that's definitely how I see the paranormal kind of like we were talking about a few minutes ago that there's so many layers and one person could see it this way. And then the person listening is like, yeah, but what about this? And then it just goes and goes and goes. I wish I could have stayed up and hung with you guys that those nights but I was too tired and, you know, I had no voice, which still isn't back all the way. Um, (laughs) But I was dying that I could not be there to hear you guys out weird each other because I'm sure that was the most fascinating part of the entire weekend. (laughs) It's always fun. It it was just a few years ago when we started going up there, it it was just started very little. Now everybody wants to come out and hear. So you get like a crowd of people out there. And we stay up way too late, way Actually, too late, too early. So, you know, oh my God. I think that last night we were up until five in the morning. So the oh. last night, no way crazy. I could hang. No way yeah. I could hang. I'm but a lightweight. Just time flies. <laughs> yeah. Well, time flies when you're, you're with your, your peers, uh, your yeah. glorious weirdos, I like to call them. So on a term of endearment and uh, we all, it's, you don't get to do it that often because, mm-hmm. you know, when I go to work, not everybody's into the paranormal it's not something I could talk about in my normal job, but just there, everybody I talk to is waiting to hear something crazy and weird, and they're all so open to it, and it's yeah. just so fun. Just meeting you, of course, hearing your story was amazing, and just I, I'm always amazed by other people and how they got into the paranormal, how new they are to it, because like I said, you could be into it for a day, and you might have an idea that I haven't thought of in over 30 years, and it just puts something together for me to help me learn, just like hopefully I could give them something that they could learn. Yeah, that that event was what well, was the first Strange Escapes that I have attended, and um, really glad that we went because we met a lot of nice people. And yes, it's amazing to spend a few days immersed with like-minded people. Um, but but it's even more than that because it's not like, ah, oh, you're all nurses or, you know, whatever. And you're talking about that kind of stuff. This stuff, like we, we are all kind of in the same field, but we all kind of do different branches of it. Mm-hmm. 
So there's still so much to be learned and shared. It's not just regurgitating the kind of the same stuff to each other. So it was a really good experience for, for me. And I thank you for the first night at the meet and greet coming up to my husband and I and talking to us because we weren't really making friends right away. And I think I told you we tried to make friends with one couple and we must have totally weirded them out because they ghosted us the rest of the weekend. Mm -hmm. We'd come down the hall and they'd like go the other way and we're like, okay, well, whatever. But we made a few good friends and people like you and a couple others that we can keep in touch with after the fact. And and that's nice because like you said, at work or in day-to-day life, you can't always talk about this stuff. You know, people are either weirded out or they don't care or they don't believe. And so you kind of feel isolated in your own little world. Yeah, Yeah, that's why I always like to make myself available. You know, living here in Connecticut, um, I always say this, it, it's a joke. I always say it's the most haunted state in, in, in the country and everybody like laughs at me, but you think about it, the Warrens were Connecticut residents, uh, some of our, you know, biggest, you know, going into the paranormal is here in Connecticut, the haunting in Connecticut, the all the conjuring movies and all that, how it stemmed from the Warrens and uh, you know, their, their nephew, John Zaffis. And, and, you know, there's so many people here. There's so many newer people. Like you, you met Becky up there. Mm -hmm. She was one of the speakers and she's, she's kind of new to it, but all that, but she puts out on social media and she has such a great message just of, you know, the transition of uh, passing away and what goes through, you know, those transitions and all that. So she, she's an amazing person too. I know she used to use, live in Pennsylvania, but she's here in Connecticut now. And it's just, there's so many people here in Connecticut inventors. The Mel meter was invented here in Connecticut. Wow. Um, so a lot of our equipment that we get was invented here. So I always like make the joke of Connecticut's most haunted state in, in the, <laughs> but you know, you don't know it's up, up for debate. But uh, I always make the joke and everybody laughs at me, but it's one of my things. Well, it's fun to have that. And I do remember you saying that, but I didn't know why. Like, I didn't know all that stuff. You just educated me. And remember, I live in the 48th state. (laughs) So (laughs) things happen late here, Uh, (laughs) you know, going with that joke where I don't know Mm -hmm. if. But we've got some pretty haunted places here. Like I said, I was just out in Bisbee, Arizona this weekend and. That's a pretty spooky Wild West place Mm -hmm. to be. Holy moly. You know, I was thinking that when we were at Mount Washington in New Hampshire, I wasn't creeped out at all. I felt perfectly fine in my room. I even took a shower in our bathroom, Um, like totally normal. But let me tell you at the Copper Queen in Bisbee. Oh, my God. Did you see the picture of the bathroom? Holy crap. (laughs) So I took my daughter with me on that trip and we slept with the bathroom light on and neither one of us could shut the bathroom door when we were in there. And no chance was I going to take a shower. I don't know what it was, but that room was so freaking scary. Very different than Mount Washington, but I couldn't put my finger on what was so what was freaking me out? But I'll tell you, I laid there all night going, do not touch me. Do not touch me. Do not touch me. I want to sleep. Don't touch me. <laughs> the whole day. I'm like, you can move my shoes. You can move my jewelry, but do not touch me in this bed. <laughs> I, I tell you, it, it, it is a little unnerving when something reaches out and touches you. I've had that happen several mm-hmm. times uh, in, in, in my yeah. career. I, I, I did have one where they said children were running around and ghost children supposedly were <laughs> running around in, in this uh, building called the Primitive Crow. And mm. I did an investigation with some friends as a group investigation. And we were up in the attic and uh, I had like a REM pod set up off to the side. And I was standing there. They were videotaping. I, I wish they had to find out how I get the video. But we were talking and all that. And then I like felt almost like a child. You know, they tug on your shirt to get your attention. Mm-hmm. It felt low on my shirt, like pulled down. And I just said, oh, I felt something just tug me on my shirt. As soon as I said that, it was almost like the kid ran away right by the REM pod. The REM pod went off just as I was uh, saying that. So it kind of, my feeling and that going on and that piece of equipment going off showed that could have been something, you know, pretty paranormal right there. So it was a great experience. Yeah. Did you end up finding out anything else or having any more stuff happen on that one? Because that sounds like a pretty cool investigation 
Yeah, it, it, it was a it was a good investigation. And I like the group investigations. Sometimes, you know, just like anybody else, if you were alone in a home for 500 years and then 20 people came in or one person came in, who are you going to interact with most? You know, it's not a comfortable thing to have a bunch of people around, you know, trying to get you to say stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It, it all depends. But I'm I'm more into the one or two people's is plenty to do an investigation. You know, that's a great observation, Tom, that I think you mentioned to me in New Hampshire, but I don't think I had really like taken it in. Um, yeah, I could see where now I'm looking back on group investigations I've done versus smaller ones and thinking you're totally right. Why would you barge in with a ton of people and try to get information when you could go in in a nice, small, tidy group and probably have a better experience for everyone um, and more mm -hmm. respectful to the spirit. So, um, but I have a question for you. So kind of on that line, John Tenney talked about, he took a group of junior high school students on a, um, an investigation. And I was thinking, oh my God, that would be so much fun to do kind of like, cause I have two girls in middle school right now. And I thought, okay, if we could gather up a couple of their friends that parents don't think I'm a complete whack job and I'm not summoning the <laughs> devil <laughs> because I'm sure there's some parents at school that totally do think that we're doing that in our house. Um, I thought it'd be so fun if we could find a relatively quote, safe, mild place to investigate, but take these young people and have an experience like that. Um, if you were to do a group like that, what would you cap your number at? What do you think would still be respectful to spirit, but fun for a group of kids? I've, I've done group investigations before for fundraisers and all that. And usually I cap it at 20, especially it depends how big the place is. Um, you know, we did in a large building where we could split everybody up, but like we did at Mount Washington, you never really had a group more than 10. So it's always good to have a, a smaller group per se with that. Um, if you are doing an investigation, if there's multiple people with you with the knowledge like you have, it's good to split them up into groups and do different areas and all that. You never want to have too many in one area. Like I said, you know, I don't want to put it this way, but if you met somebody at the bar and all that and you're talking to them, you're probably gonna have a better conversation than if 20 people were standing there trying to talk to the same person. Absolutely. So it just, it just doesn't work. You're just not going to be in tune to get the right information. Stuff still could, could still happen, but I, I just don't think you're going to get what you need to make the investigation go forward. Yeah, that makes sense. So I would think maybe like two groups of three or four kiddos at the most would mm -hmm. probably be good for each person to kind of have an experience, hopefully. But I thought dang, I wish I had a mom as cool as me when I was a kid that would be like, hey, for your birthday, we're going to do a paranormal investigation. <laughs> like, that'd be super fun, right? Yeah, it, it's funny. My my kids grew up with me doing this. So I don't think any of them in the middle of the night ever came to my bed, say, dad, I'm scared. I want to climb in bed with you. So I, I think they've, from a young age, realized that, oh, you know, it could be just this. I'm just going to go back to sleep. So it was it, their normal. Yeah. Yeah. It's just empower them that, you know, the unknown isn't always something you need to fear. You just need to question it and uh, try things out and see what's going on. It could just have been the tree outside uh, hitting the glass. So try things out and go back to sleep and they're fine. So. Totally. We were yeah. raising the kids that same way too. So our six-year-old, I do think I might've told the story, uh, came running in our room one morning at like five in the morning. She's like, there's a man in my room playing with my toys. <laughs> and so you met my husband, investigator, ex-policeman. He's like, what? There's a man in your room? I'm like, oh, honey, it's probably just a spirit. It's fine. <laughs> so yeah. ended up that, of course, it was just a spirit. Um, but mm -hmm. she saw a full body apparition walk from her laundry hamper over to her toy box and pick up her toy and was playing with it. And later I used, you know, through a reading of a client found out that it was his family member. So, um, wow. I think he was just there trying to give me a heads up, but, um, that one was interesting because the spirit that was in her room playing with her toys, I kept getting the vibe that he was in his forties, but I kept hearing childlike, childlike. Mm -hmm. It was so weird. And then later when I was reading for the client, 
he told me that he had had an uncle who had the mentality of an eight-year-old, but didn't pass away until he was in his forties. I'm like, bingo, that makes sense. But there it was right there with my six-year-old. And so now they talk about, remember when I had a spirit in my room and he was playing with my toys? So I don't know, am I damaging my kids? They're going to grow up weird. No, I I don't (laughs) think so. Because you just gave me an idea. There was a TV show quite a few years ago, my friend Chip Coffee. Uh, was one of the hosts on it where they helped young children with their learning about their abilities. Oh, so, I think I remember that. Yeah. And I'm thinking with you and talking about bringing kids out into an investigation, maybe some kids that, you know, might find out they have some abilities and all that. And you could help, you know, them develop that by going to certain places and see what they pick up to help them not be afraid that, you know, hey, I could see the other side. I'm afraid, you know, right. it helps, you know, them develop that where they're not fearing it so, and just use it as a gift. Absolutely. And by having them um, process what they're seeing or feeling or hearing, whatever way they're getting the information, and then talking about it with them and then showing boundaries. How do you have boundaries? I like to joke when I'm talking to new people who are like, oh my gosh, I'm inundated all the time with information. I don't know what to do. I jokingly say, look, you set boundaries. You can be like, I only want to hear from you on Tuesdays at 2 PM. That's it. If it's not Tuesday on two at 2 PM, no spirits can talk to me. And again, that's extreme and a joke, but Mm -hmm. I try to make the point you are in charge, not spirit when it comes to when and how you want to connect. And that's, I think, really valuable for kids who, like you're saying, may be having these experiences because they're psychic or mediumistic, but they just don't know. Exactly. What That's exactly what I've been dealing with, with this, the current clients that we have and all that. So still trying to help him develop. He just, you know, he, he's open to it, but he's just still has that fear stage of it. You know, Aww. is anything going to hurt me? And, you know, just trying to help him the other day, create boundaries with my partner, She's fantastic with that type of thing. You know, that's what she does for a living. She sounds you know, wonderful. Yeah, she's she's fantastic. And her name is Jenna Beth. So oh. she goes by JB. So she's fantastic. You know, it's hard because I've done this by myself for so many years. And I'm very protective of my clients uh, to, you know, I want to make sure if somebody's going to be working with me, they have to, you know, kind of share the same values and all that. And we do, you know, we both our parents and all that. We both have that, that similar background and we want to help people no matter, you know, what it takes until we could get, take that fear away from them and educate them where they can empower themselves and take back their house if they have to. That's important. It's important to have somebody you trust working with you. How old, how old is the little boy that you're helping? If you don't mind me asking. Well, I call him a little boy, but he's, he's 18. So. Oh, well that's still young, but I was yeah. asking because, um, you know, I think I mentioned that I've trained in England. I've trained in the U S with my mediumship, but I've also gone to England a few times and l- I'm not just saying it legitimately. They have laws there. You cannot talk to children about mediumship development before they're the age of 16. Like legally mm-hmm. you can get in trouble. Um, so I had to walk a really fine line when talking to some of my mentors and peers over there, like about my children's experiences. Um, and I have to be careful to say, I'm not helping them develop, but you know, my fingers are crossed behind my back because here we don't have the same, uh, laws, thankfully. And I think if you do it in a, in the right way with the right intentions, you're not going to cause harm. Um, but for a man, a boy of 18, that's still very young and very impressionable. Mm -hmm. And it could be scary and it could change the trajectory of his life. If he doesn't know what's going on, a lot of people who become mediums or psychics or how do I phrase this? Um, some people end up in drugs or alcoholism because they don't understand that they're getting messages from spirit and they don't know what to do with it. So I think it's important to educate young people. Definitely. Oh my gosh. I've had so much fun talking to you, Tom. It was wonderful to see you again. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm going to look, I know I had a list of questions, but we were just kind of talking and, um, let me see here. Oh, okay. Here's a good one. Um, if you were to give advice 
to a beginner, someone just starting out on the paranormal investigation path, something you wish you knew back then that you didn't, what piece of advice would you like to share with the newbies? I think with the paranormal and having an experience or anything like that, or going in with the right way of doing things comes down to one word, intent. Everything in the paranormal is based off of intent. You could have the bad intent and you could have positive intent, but it's always want to have that positive intent and what you put into it. So if you think something's not going to happen, it probably isn't going to happen. But if you have the intent, like we do, we go into investigation that we want to speak to the spirits our good intent to help them, you know, do our, our best foot forward. But anybody into it new, you don't need a lot of equipment. John Tenney's right. <laughs> I, I have some cool stuff, but I don't have a lot of equipment. You know, I, mm -hmm. when we're videotaping, I don't even put like cameras up really that much. I, we use our phones and videotape our equipment while we're doing it. If something comes up, I think it's important to stay concentrating on the spirit and all that. And sometimes that stuff just takes away from it. So if I'm feeling something, it's nice to see the piece of equipment react too. So that just tells me, Hey, I'm on the right track. So, but new to it, intent, oh, make sure I you have the right intent. I love it. I love it. I love it. And because you said that, you made me remember that was one thing that was super impressive to me on our adventure in New Hampshire. Greg and Dana Newkirk, when we started our investigation with them, we all sat in the circle. Before we did anything, Greg walked all of us through a visualization to set our group intention. And that is so important. And that stood out to me because they made a big deal out of doing that. And I agree with you. Intentions, everything. And who was it that spoke? I think it was Dana um, who said, you get what you bait your hook for, you know, and, and that's so accurate. Your intent is what matters. So I love that you would impart that on new people first off. Yes, absolutely. It, it definitely have to. Okay. Last thing, because I know I've had you for almost an hour now. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. Tell me, Archangel of Par of the Paranormal, where where'd this come from? Why? And all the details on that one. I think a lot of it is just in general of the Archangel Michael. Uh, in general is a prayer I have on the back of my business card. Mm -hmm. I just think my whole life, I really look at it this way. If I'm helping people, whether, you know, some things could get really nasty and evil. And I know that God sent the Archangel Michael to defeat the devil. So, and that's kind of what I try and do for people, you know, as the living person to try and defeat the fear uh, with, you know, a lot of people may not believe in God or anything like that. I don't believe in really organized religion, but I do believe there's a higher being. And I try and work through that higher being to help people here on you know, in our plane here. And I think the Archangel Michael is probably the best symbol of that and how it defeats, you know, our biggest fears and the worst things that could happen to us. That's beautiful. I love it. Do you, do you think that you consciously chose that to be your title or do you think that that was divinely orchestrated? You got a little nudge or a message to use that. How did that come about? Well, Again, I don't believe in coincidences, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think it just one of those things that came to my mind and I got goosebumps. So, yeah. And uh, I think that's what I got to go with. I think, uh, especially now, I think lately with, with my partner, Jenna Beth, and just some of these things that we've been getting that have been to the point where I think these last two cases we could write full books on of just everything that happened. I could talk for like hours and hours about information we got, um, just anything like that. And I, I come to the point where I start naming them, you know? So the, the, the initial one that I was talking about with the, the murder, you know, is I, the murder knocks three times because it was always knocking three times on the wall. And then, you know, this new one's the Enfield entity. So, and there's just, I, I like to name them because I said, if I ever write a book about it, I I better have a title for it. <laughs> but yeah. I don't know, maybe a book about the case files would be great, but you know, I'm a songwriter. I've never written a book and uh, hopefully uh, I'll get the inspiration to do it. I have the ideas. So if anybody's out there wants to help me out <laughs> as a ghostwriter, so you could help Seriously, me out. Seriously, <laughs> I want a ghostwriter too. Yeah. Well, um, 
Oh my gosh. If you ever want to come back on here and talk about some of your stories, you are always welcome because the stories are super fun, super interesting. And I love that stuff. Um, so you're welcome anytime. And maybe we can both find a ghostwriter. Um, okay. So Tom, tell everyone how they can find you. Well, on Facebook, they didn't let me uh, change it to the Archangel of the Paranormal. So it's still my name, Thomas Patrick Gormley on Facebook. I'm also on uh, TikTok and Instagram has the Archangel of the Paranormal that you could find me. You'll probably see my little picture with my favorite pirate skeleton next to me. So that's how you'll find me. Okay, awesome. And if you ever have any plans to come all the way out here to Arizona, we have to do an investigation together for sure. That would be awesome. That'd be super fun. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Tom, thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been wonderful to see you again and chat with you and get to know you a little bit more. And I just really appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate you too. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for joining me again on All Is Not Lost. I just love having you here. I love talking about these things that are valuable and important and bring comfort and healing to our lives or some excitement. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good ghost story? So I love having you here listening and sharing these experiences with me. If you'd like to be a guest on this show or you have a topic idea for the show, you can find us at allisnotlostpodcast.com and click on the tab, be a guest. If you're interested in a mediumship reading with me, or you're just curious about what a reading looks like, you can also visit me at rianmaldonado.com. I will put the link of that in the show notes. <clears throat> I, I know my name is hard to spell. Also, if you've enjoyed today's episode or any of our episodes, please be sure to rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps me continue to bring you exciting and impactful guests and also provide you with useful content. And as always, thank you so much for listening to All Is Not Lost, and I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>